Welcome back all. I hope you had a nice break and had the chance to do some networking because of course networking is the first step to every wonderful collaboration out there. So we do encourage you to do that. Now, for those of you watching us online, welcome back as well. We've spoken in the morning about integrating uh, the arts and culture in every aspect of education. We've been talking about recognizing uh, the role of the informal economy and, of course, the value of innovative business models. And we're going to be picking from where we left off. The title to our second session, which is about to start, is Calling on Opportunities for Research and Development, Alternative Finance and Local and International Cooperation. Exciting topics again. Um, well, for uh, this, I have a distinguished lineup of speakers as well in this session. Marcel Kraus, Technology and Knowledge Transfer Center, Charles University, head of Hiberniska campus. Could you please kindly make it to the stage? Thank you very much. Dr. Duanita Larasati, head of Strategic Partnerships, Indonesia Creative Cities Network. Hello. Hello. Edna Dos Santos Dusenberg, economist, policy advisor and researcher on creative economy and development. Welcome. <laughs> Laura Callanan, founding partner of Upstart CoLab. Welcome. <laughs> and our moderator is someone who you know really well, John Newbegin, chair of the pack. Welcome. I'll leave the floor to you and we'll be back. Thanks. Thank you, Elif, and welcome back, everybody. And uh, let's go straight into it. Uh, as with the previous session, please ask your questions. We had lots of really, really good questions in that last session. Put your questions up. If you like somebody else's question, indicate like, because then it helps us to choose the most popular questions. But let's go straight into the presentations. Marcel. OK. So hello, everyone. My name is Marcel Kraus. And as you heard, I work for Knowledge and Technology Transfer Center of Charles University in Prague. And I'm a team leader at the same time in uh, Campus Hibernska. This is a place where all subjects and faculties met in order to create some new environment and interdisciplinary research uh, together with uh, citizens of Prague and the whole society. And I would like to put attention on a particular topic connected with the creative industries, and this is academia research, innovation, and social sciences and humanities, including artistic research, how they relate together. I think that the global challenges need complex solutions. I think it is obvious uh, we cannot solve this complex solutions just with the help of one subject, we need inclusive uh, look at the problem, at the research questions, in order to bring sustainable solutions for those challenges. Um, be it technological oriented, economic, and environmental, digital, I don't know, post-pandemic, or health, or security challenges, all those challenges need societal perspective in order to be really solved. Uh, and I think the research and innovations led by academia, together with other stakeholders outside of academia, is a good way how to approach those and, and address those uh, challenges. And I would like to stress that the SSHA, this is an abbreviation for social sciences, humanities, and arts or artistic research, can play their significant role. Um, let's have a stop for a while here at this slide and have, let's have a look what does it actually mean, SSHA, social sciences, humanities, and arts. Maybe you were surprised what belong under these uh, areas. Uh, we have here uh, psychology, cognitive sciences, economy, businesses, industrial relations, management, uh, I don't know, gender studies, sociology, but also journalism, media and communication, cultural and economic geography, uh, design in architecture, musicology, 
religions, arts, of course, uh, philosophy, studies on film, radio and TVs, folklore studies, de demography, uh, uh, law, etc., etc. Those all subjects play significant role in today's innovations and in the cultural and creative industries too. There is one interesting concept called also STEAM, like science, technology, engineering, art and mathematics. And in this concept, concept I see the A as a something what can cover all those subjects above, SSHA. So we can call uh, also STEAM plus, it means we have here natural sciences, we have here medicines and other subjects which can help us uh, together with creative industries to solve those solutions. So let's have focus further on the SSHA. I have, have here several examples where in the culture and creative industries, the SSHA can be useful in a transdisciplinary way or interdisciplinary way or inclusive way. For example, uh, the reduction, uh, reduction of uh, vulnerability of children producing and consuming creative content uh, at the internet. Prosumers, uh, producers, consumers, prosumers, uh, in order to solve it really on a long term and sustainable way, we need to collect several subjects. For example, law makers or media scientists. Uh, sociologists, etc., etc. They need to meet in order to solve this problem. Yeah? Uh, other example comes from uh, car industries. We need designers to design a new setup of uh, seat belts, for example, for pregnant women or for people with uh, different kind of disabilities. So again, we need to meet <laughs> in a one research project several uh, experts from design, sociologists, engineering, car developers, uh, etc., etc. Third example is based on a PC games. This is a very core of the culture creative uh, industries. The PC games tools can be used for, for example, um, educational purposes. Uh, I have one example actually coming from the Czech Republic, from the Charles University. Charles Games, this is a startup focusing on uh, development of PC games with the added value in education and history. Historically correct PC games for educational purposes. Artistic research, this is something very <laughs> very interesting in the cultural creative industries because we are using artistic <coughs> methods for creating new concepts, new knowledge, or new kind of solutions. Here is an example using theater for social integration through the artistic research. And a fifth example is a use of artificial intelligence for ethical and responsible adv advertisement. Advertisement, other part of the creative industries, but we need to use it ethically or morally correct. But in the same time, we need to put together to one table mathematicians, philosophers, media scientists, for example. So I would like to show with this slide that the interdisciplinary approach and research in academia and with cultural creative industries is crucial for solving such a challenges which faces today's society. Okay, uh, we, can, we can say that the activities of cultural creative industries uh, seems in the same time to offer a suitable environment for such a research. It is really not easy to conduct interdisciplinary research yeah, as such, because you have to understand each other, you have to know how to um, connect different knowledge areas, how to understand between each other about motivations, about the problem solving. It is not easy work, but it pays off. Uh, 
I think that it can lead to impact-oriented research and innovation in the same time. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it requires uh, support, um, funding, maybe space, yeah, like like Hibernska campus or um, hubs, uh, atelier. We, we saw it uh, uh, yesterday. So it is it it cannot happen without support, without um, understanding that it is needed. And we need uh, several stakeholders to put together to one table in order to create such an environment. Uh, a very important role is played in this paradigm shift in innovation, let's say, policy makers on a different level, state level, city level, because they can help to create such an environment for it. Yeah? And in the same, same time, this is very interesting, <laughs> uh, the cultural creative industries and their innovation potential can actually solve any other related policy. It is not only about the policy for or about cultural creative industries, but uh, it relates with education, with um, new workforce policy, economical policy, green economy policy. Everything has something to do with creativity, with cultural creative industries, and actually vice versa. Cultural creative industries can easily help to implement those policies on a creative way, on an innovative way. And this is my last slide and something what I would like to leave here behind. <laughs> and uh, this is the thing that SSH matters, social sciences, humanities, arts matters, and that it is necessary to emancipate those scientific subjects in the innovation and research ecosystems. It is unfortunately not fully recognized as an equal part to, I don't know, technological oriented research or natural sciences or medicine, social sciences, humanities, um, arts, it seems not to be able to, to create uh, prosperity or markets, maybe in the first plan, not the monetization of their added value is hard, but they can contribute to us other way, for example, by savings of public money, or increasing quality of life, or savings human lives. Yeah? So that's why they are important in the creative ecosystem and the innova uh, innovation ecosystem too. So let's have a focus on cultural creative industries, social sciences, arts, humanities, and then together we can create new quality of life for today's society. So this was this is my message. Thank you. Marcel, thank you. Uh, and in the same way that in drawing up our 11 point global agenda, we noticed that science, research and development in the creative sector is as important as research and development is in science and technology. We also address the question of finance. A different kind of economy needs a different and more varied kind of finance. So next we're going to hear from Laura Callanan on alternative forms of finance. Excuse me. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Laura Callanan. I'm the founding partner of Upstart CoLab. At Upstart, we believe that creative people solve problems, and we are connecting capital with creative people who make a profit and make a difference. We work at the intersection of impact investing and the creative economy. What is impact investing? It's investing. It's not a grant. It's not philanthropy. It's not a subsidy. It's proper investing, seeking a financial return, but not only a financial return. Impact investing is also thoughtful about workers, communities, and the environment. Impact investors are seeking a financial return as well as social and environmental impact. 
all types of financing instruments, stocks, shares, equity investments, loans, debt, guarantees, all versions of financial instruments are possible in the concept of impact investing. So I'm not going to go into that in detail today, but I'm going to pick up on the earlier conversations this morning about the social impact that can be accomplished by investing in the creative industries. These are the five dimensions of social impact that we seek to achieve at my organization, Upstart CoLab. As you can see, it's very focused on people, beginning with an emphasis on black, indigenous, and people of color, and women who are entrepreneurs, often artists, designers, and other creatives who are launching for-profit social purpose businesses in the creative industries. As has already been discussed today, we agree that the creative industries is a strong source of quality jobs in the 21st century creative economy. And we know that creative places and businesses can anchor vibrant communities and play an important role in comprehensive community development. These first three impact areas are very familiar to impact investors. Financial inclusion, quality jobs, community development are all concepts that impact investors seek to achieve not only in the creative industries, but in all of their investment activities. The second two concepts, which feature artists, designers, and creatives, are more particular to the creative industries. We're thinking about lives and livelihoods that are sustainable for artists, designers, and other creative people. And we're thinking about our concept of the inclusive creative economy that considers creative people, their neighbors, and all of us a concept that believes in both the power of traditional wisdom and innovation, the importance of openness and experimentation, and the benefits of diversity and inclusion. When the United Nations Development Program did a landscaping for Turkey in 2019 and identified the opportunity that impact investing can play here, the research spotlighted three types of impact very compatible with the, the five dimensions that I'm sharing with you here, and specifically suggested that impact investing could be useful with a focus on refugee livelihoods, a focus on women's empowerment, and a focus on financial inclusion. So I'll, I'm just going to briefly describe two examples where these dimensions of impact can be understood. Uh, this first company is a fashion company. It's called Pasco. It's led by a black fashion designer, Patrick Robinson. Before launching his own fashion label, Pasco, eight years ago, Patrick was the creative director at The Gap. Earlier in his career, he led Emporio Armani, Perry Ellis, other big fashion brands. So he came to his uh, moment as a social entrepreneur after a successful career as a fashion designer. And originally, Patrick was thinking about how to make up for his career in fashion and all of the negative environmental impacts he had, cre he had contributed to, uh, working for places like The Gap in particular. He was very much focused on improving environmental sustainability in the fashion industry. And he focused on the fact that most of us only wear 20% of the clothes in our closets, so he wanted to make that 20%. He wanted to make the clothes that you wear and wear again and do it in a way the clothes are stylish, they're dependable, they're comfortable, you can wear them for leisure, you can wear them for fashion. He wanted to make the 20% of clothes that people really use. In the midst of the pandemic, he also started to really think about workers and communities. He, he maintained the focus on environmental sustainability but he introduced a new mode of production, what Patrick calls community made. So rather than having a single factory where workers need to be there, show up, go to that one place to manufacture the clothes for Pasco, he has taken on a distributed production model where there are community made workers pods and he brings the jobs and the opportunity to disadvantaged communities where there are talented, skilled makers. He's focused on bringing dignified work back to makers in America. He opened his first community-made workers pod in New York City in the midst of COVID when the Broadway theater district was dark and he hired people from the costume shops. So they had been making costumes for Lion King and Hamilton in the big Broadway shows. They were out of work for 18 months because of the pandemic. They started to sew for Pasco. 
His second workers' pod is in Gee's Bend, Alabama, home of third and fourth generation quilters whose work hangs in museums around the world and is highly valued. But most of the people in this community are living in deep, deep poverty. So there is great cultural wealth, there is little economic wealth. And by uh, bringing the company to this community, he's brought the first new job creation to G's Bend, Alabama since the 1960s. He also brought the internet as an example of an unintended positive consequence of this social purpose business showing up. Uh, he brought satellites, put them on the, the roof of the building that he's renting, that's the workshop and the warehouse, and he brought this community online. His slogan is clothes made like they matter. He's wanting customers to understand and respect the people behind the clothes that they wear. The investors in this company are foundations who think about communities and workers as well as making money on their investment. The second example is led by an actress director named Mary Stuart Masterson. You can find her movies on Netflix. She was especially popular in the 1980s and she has launched uh, an ecosystem for film and TV in the Hudson Valley of New York State, two hours north of New York City. Uh, it's women-led, it's environmentally forward. The, the film and TV production studio is uh, unique, but it's not the only thing that she has launched. Uh, it's part of a three-pronged ecosystem approach. So yes, the opportunity for investment is in the film and TV soundstage called Upriver Studios. But before she launched the social purpose for-profit business that is Upriver Studios, she began by working with state government to introduce a tax credit, a financial incentive to attract film and TV production to come to this geographic region, to make it financially attractive to bring the show to this part of the, the state. Secondly, she launched a, an NGO, a non-governmental organization, to do workforce training because every film and TV production hires 200 people to do sets and lights and makeup, a whole range of, of behind the scene jobs. And you don't bring 200 people to a community for six months or a year to, to film your, your, your movie. They need, there needs to be a talented, trained resident workforce. And she wanted to be sure that the people who have op the access to these 21st century quality jobs in film and TV production included women, people of color, folks who don't have easy access to these great union quality jobs now. The third piece of the, the puzzle was this film and TV production facility. It's structured as a public benefit LLC, which means it's a type of business that in its incorporation documents is very clear that it seeks to make money, but it also is going to be focused on treating workers well, being a good community citizen, and being thoughtful about the environment. The investors in this company are artists themselves, one filmmaker, one visual artist, uh, and, and another um, multimedia artist, all with wealth, but wanting to invest in something that they understood and that they believed in. So just to close, I'll say that impact investing in the United States is 25 years old. The work that I'm doing at my organization is introducing the importance of art, design, culture, heritage, and creativity, and a, and a focus on the creative industries to American impact investors. In places in the world like wider Europe, where Im impact investing is still young, you have a unique opportunity to integrate a conversation about the, the creative industries now immediately as the impact investing grows, that it will grow with a deep understanding and appreciation of the power and potential of the creative industries to deliver opportunities for workers, communities, and the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, when we think about policy, as we were thinking about with our 11-point agenda, uh, the temptation is always to think about policy in a national context, but we wanted to address some issues that need to be resolved at an international context and in a local context and to draw the links between local, national and international because I'm sure everybody here knows that so much that happens in the creative economy and the creative industries happens at local level. Uh, so we wanted to address that, regional, city uh, and locality issues, but also we need to have an international framework 
of agreements and trade to make this new economy work. So our next two speakers, we're going to hear first about from an international dimension from Edna and then from a local and regional dimension from Tita. So Edna. Thank you. Can I have this, my slides? Well, first of all, my name is Edna de Santos. I, I am an economist, and I developed my career at the United Nations in Geneva, where I set up the first program exclusively devoted to the creative economy. And I was also very proud to launch the very first UN creative economy report uh, already uh, in 2008. I also would like to first uh, express my thanks to Bridge Council and all the organizers because we are very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be back in Istanbul and particularly to see that the last time I was here was 10 years ago we talk about the creative economy. And this time, I was very happy because we could see the practice of the creative economy. Particularly yesterday, we saw a number of uh, very successful products. So I think this is why it's so important that we start talking in the international uh, framework and then you see how things are being implemented in practice. So, um, yes. So, I would like to, to share some insights on the importance of governance and uh, uh, the international cooperation. And, of course, it's uh, very it's difficult. Uh, I think it, we mentioned already this morning that uh, our society it's is going through a very, <laughs> yes, I would like to, okay. uh, a very important uh, transformation. Yes? Sorry, it's not showing there. Can I? <laughs> it's not showing No? Showing. Yes, okay. <laughs> Our society is going through a very deep transformation because, of course, we were already undergoing very important changes in structural changes, technological changes, cultural changes, social changes. But, of course, after two years of a pandemic, the pandemic has accelerated this whole process and uh, it really impact all of us, not only individually, but the whole economy. And uh, we know that nowadays one of the biggest policy challenges for every single government being at local, regional or international level is really to resume growth because we are living in a moment that we have slow growth you have a high inflation, and you have a big risk of a global, what we call, stagflation. And in this context, this very difficult context, what happened is that uh, unemployment is rising everywhere, independent of the level of a development, unemployment is high. And we know that there was a big change also in the structure of the job market. Another important point is the fact that we cannot ignore all the geopolitical tensions we are facing today. So we have war, we have climate change, we have migration issues, we have elections going on in a number of countries, and also, as impact of all that, we are facing a moment that we have to deal with the energy crisis, with the food crisis, and inequality uh, became much more visible everywhere. So, it's in this context 
that uh, governments, and when you talk about governance, it's a very difficult moment in which you have uh, to address these very complex global issues, but at the same time, we have to deal with this transition towards a more inclusive, a greener, and a more diverse economy. And if you think in terms of what is the international policy context we are in, it's really the UN Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. And this means that you are in 22, so we have only 80 years to go to all this, to reach the goals that the governments were committed. Uh, so we need policy will, and we need very concrete actions now. So in this context of the international environment, also what was very important was the last year 2021, the UN General Assembly declared the International Year for the Creative Economy and Sustainable Development. So this was a very important uh, political support for the creative economy as a whole. And uh, we know uh, also that was very important, the recognition in various forums, but in particular by the G20, that uh, culture and creative economy can really be very important in this healing process post-pandemic. And in this context, it is really time for looking to the creative economy in, with this global perspective. So we are not only to the sector, but we are only seeing the creative economy as a strategy that can be used to governments to address a number of issues. And if we ask ourselves, we have been talking about the importance of cooperation, but the importance of international cooperation, the importance of a multilateral process, and if we ask ourselves why this is important, and I would say that this is important to ensure that the benefits of the creative economy can respond to the requirements of all countries. And uh, why we need this international cooperation is because global processes have a very clear impact in shaping policies at national, local, and international levels. We also know that multilateral negotiations and intergovernmental processes are decisive for advancing policies at the different levels. If you only think about the result of the COP27 uh, last week, we can see the result was very meagre. But we are advancing step by step, so it's part of the whole process. And in particular, why it is important is because the creative economy has to be seen in this global context, we cannot see the creative economy in isolation. Of course, we have to put policies in place to reinforce the sector, but we have to see with this holistic approach, with how it really impacts in the whole economy. And if you ask ourselves how this international cooperation takes place, it takes place through the uh, negotiations, discussions, everything that is taking place in the context of the United Nations family. So here you have all the institutions, UNESCO, UNCTAD, uh, ILO, and so on. We have also, uh, the topic is being addressed by a number of other international organizations and it's very important what is decided, for instance, in the World Trade Organization, uh, the World Bank. Uh, then you have the, also the regional institutions. Uh, and 
what is important, what all these institutions have in common, is that the creative economy is, is in the agenda of all these institutions. So when we are discussing creative economy in different contexts, but in, in different bodies, we are really pushing for this international cooperation to have a better understanding of the sector and really somehow to assist the governments in uh, understand better, to grasp the issues and to really uh, decide on what are the best policies to be put in place. And if we ask ourselves, even in the context of PEC or in the context of individual governments, what they should do, there is a number of issues that we have to look internally, but you really need this international cooperation if you want to advance, like uh, review of regulations on uh, intellectual property, on global standards to collect the statistics, uh, if you need, uh, uh, for instance, uh, specific commitments for discussions that are taking place in WTO. So we have to review uh, a number of commitments. Uh, so I think it's very important that we have to design these national policies, but also take into account what is going on in terms of the international arena. So, uh, we don't have time to go into detail on this, all these questions. If you think about internet governance, if you think about uh, international trade agreements, but the points I want to make is that uh, all the tools like uh, the use of commercial diplomacy, the international agreements, uh, all uh, discussions about you need a revision in intellectual property regimes. Uh, you need to have the discussion in organizations and you have to push for this multilateral cooperation. Um, and uh, in this whole context, policies can only advance, but we need the consensus. And this is what is not so easy because the consensus building is very important if you really want to advance international cooperation to deal with these more complex issues. And uh, to conclude, I just want to make the point of the importance of the, uh, this global vision, the international cooperation, and how you translate it in terms of domestic policies at the national level. And of course, in this context, we can see that cultural diplomacy, branding, soft power, if we come back for uh, what we have seen last night, it was very important when uh, Istanbul is presenting its vision 2050, uh, is really in a way of uh, a strategy that they are looking but in bringing together all the 40 countries that they want to have this network of creative cities, this is really a very concrete example of the kind of cooperation we are talking about in practice at the regional level. So I just want to make the point that uh, uh, art, culture, and creative products, they are very important soft powers that can help a country to build upon its image and try to do better. Um, it's very important also the whole question of city branding, particularly if you think that in this post-pandemic period, we are rethinking how to revitalize life in cities and the creative economy really has a very strong role to play. And uh, so, I just want to mention that uh, we mentioned before in early discussion the importance of cooperation, but the importance of diplomacy, uh, networks, platforms, uh, co-creations, 
And I think the fact that during the pandemic, we were connected. And I think what was very important in this pandemic is that we realize that culture, connectivity, and uh, creativity were really like a backbone of the society because it was what helped us to feel that we are together even if we were apart. And I think this was very important. And I think despite all the difficulties that we are facing uh, to have the, uh, creative policies in place, I think what was important was the recognition that the sector is extremely important and nowadays is part of the national agenda in every single country. Because uh, this and this is very important. So I think despite of the difficulties you might face for financing the sector, we still need to upgrade skills, we need the capacity building. And when we talk about capacity building, it's not only at the academic level, it's also for policymakers to understand better how the sector interacts with the whole economy, how the sector interacts with the global processes. So in this point, I just would like to say that, uh, for instance, even what was mentioned yesterday, the fact that we are rethinking policies for at city level. And in the past, cities were trying to be smart, but nowadays they have to face the challenges to be at the same time smart, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. So I think how, I think the bigger question is to see how governments should put in place policies that would at the same time promote growth, but would also look into questions like the well-being, like sustainability, and particularly all these questions that became much more clear that we have cannot be overlooked after the pandemic. So in conclusion, I just want to stress the point that national policies are very important for the global international framework and vice versa, because it's very difficult design a national policies if you are not having a better understanding of how this global process interact. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Edna. Uh, and please, as with the previous session, keep your questions coming on Slido. If you like a question that's already there, indicate that you like it, and then we can choose a few questions to address after our last speaker, Dr. Tita Larasati. Tita. Thank you, John. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to share today is mostly about how community initiatives uh, can influence policy, actually. So uh, my name is Tita. I'm from Indonesia. I'm an industrial designer. Uh, lecturer, researcher, but I'm active in communities uh, such as you see here. Somebody usually they mention uh, but that this is creative industries clusters and so on. But we can see that one cluster cannot work alone. It should be intersecting with another. So it's more about also intersection. Um, and uh, the examples coming from Indonesia, the, of course the country I know best because I live there, I, I grew up there, I was born there. Um, with this number, a country with 200 something million people, uh, population, who speaks 700 something language, hundreds of tribes and so on. Uh, this has become our potential, our richness in getting inspirations, resources and so on. But at the same time, it also gives us a big challenge in, this, in the sense of uh, distributions, access, especially equal access to basic needs and so on and so on. Um, and we are dominated by young generations. Uh, now they are also having lots of access uh, to internet. And how will they use this new technology? And if we don't prepare them properly, uh, they should actually um, feel the next development and so on. But if they use internet for negative things, then there's also another damage. So that's what we are taking care about. But we're so lucky that um, most of 
young people in cities, uh, in different provinces, islands, and so on, they realize that we cannot keep relying on income from digging minerals, cutting trees, and so on. So they start uh, moving from this extractive economy to intersecting economy. They start to use their potentials to create, uh, to express themselves, and so on, and monetize them, making them into activities, and so on. Um, but uh, most of them, uh, young people, they then um, form communities uh, in their respective uh, cities and regencies, and they also connect to each other through a network because they need to work together within these industries. Uh, we've been doing, maybe now it's called creative industries, creative economies, and so on, but we've been doing that uh, before the term is up there as a formal term or as in governmental structure. So uh, now that they have labels, they have names, they have to mine what the, nom uh, the nomenclature and on. Uh, our local governments, although the central government already have a ministry for it, already have uh, some department for it at city level, but not everybody really know what, uh, what they should do or how, how should they um, provide facilities and so on to these kind of communities. So we uh, uh, at the grassroots effort, we at the um, professionals and so on, uh, we continue by making these communities and we continue doing this uh, in programs and events and eventually uh, sometimes, most of the times, uh, it's an expression that um, we want to make our city better. We want to make our living place uh, really more pleasant to us, accommodate what we need, and sometimes what they need is place to express themselves, place to do tradings, place to, uh, to exist. And if we do it um, consistently, then sometimes it also turn the social dynamics and we make social innovation within our places. So um, I now live in Bandung, which is the capital city of West Java. It's the most populated uh, province in Indonesia. 30% of the uh, population live there. So we have also a lot of young people. And uh, th that, that's how we, we have been building, we call it prototypes or maybe examples. Or Omar earlier said that it can be a, a sample of uh, best practices, small scale. Um, but at least we let the government and the people know that this is what, uh, what kind of park we want to have. This is the kind of public advertisement that we want to have. Uh, of course, we have it only for two weeks or maybe a weekend, but at least people experience it and the government can catch what we mean by it. So, oh, okay, it's, it's nice to have public art or it's nice to have uh, uh, activities uh, like so-and-so. And then, then from those examples, they can maybe ad adjust it to their policy. Sometimes not, most of the, or most of the times not, but at least uh, we have the feeling of, of how it happens. So other cities actually do that, uh, do that too with their communities. And when we connect to each other, then we grow ourselves into this, um, so we form this Indonesia Creative Cities Network. And now uh, we have more than 240 cities joining us. And it's a way uh, for us to back up each other because not all communities have nice, harmonious relationship with their government. And if, uh, and if they don't, and if they want to say what they want, uh, then we can support them of how they say it. Um, and these young people, most of the times, uh, when, they do, uh, when they do this time of uh, creative uh, economy activation, they occupy a space and they organically um, change that place into a space that they like. So this is what may be called placemaking nowadays. But these are communities driven organic growth of spaces because they're using idle space. For example, at uh, Gudang Selatan is actually a military warehouse. It used to store the logistics and all. It's not used now, but it's still the property of the military. So they come there, they rent really cheap. So they then build studios, uh, amphitheaters, restaurants, cafe, and so on. And that happens as well uh, with the wet market. So in the morning, you have your uh, marketplace selling vegetables, chickens, meats, and so on. But then uh, when the marketplace is over in the afternoon, then starting afternoon to night, they use all these um, um, booths uh, also as cafe or to watch movies, uh, say, um, watch poetry, and so on. So this has been happening also in other places in Indonesia. So with this, 
actually because the local governments are actually the administrators of these places. So what we need from them is maybe we don't need um, just financial support, but we need only their permission or a guarantee that we can still use this place as we want. We just need a bit of regulation. So how, we do, how do we do it at the national level? Is we, uh, we are uh, committed to this kind of framework. So if we have communities in other parts of Indonesia, or in, a, in a remote islands or in rural areas, uh, what should they say to their authorities if they want to apply for, so, uh, for certain um, facilities? of a certain policy that can match uh, with their needs. So this is what we pr provide to them. First is we, um, we have the consensus that if we talk about creative uh, economy, it should be an ecosystem that also includes creative industries, and we have mapped the government's role in each of these elements. And if we talk about stakeholders, we have now uh, what we call here aggregator, but like Alfredo mentioned earlier, it's mostly about intermediary. So we intermediate. Uh, all the actors that needs uh, access, that needs uh, communication uh, tools and so on to proceed with their uh, application. And we are committed to the 10 principles of creative cities in Indonesia particularly. So these are keywords that if we say what is creative city. So it is a city that, um, for example, uh, respect uh, diversities or human rights or uh, heritage and so on and so on. So economy is there, but it's not the first one. But first we have to make sure that everything in the city can be stable or support that kind of uh, movement. And if a city or agency asks, uh, so how do you start or, or how do we make it, then we give them the 11 ways to implement the, the 10 principles. They can choose uh, one or more tools that they can use for their own uh, needs in their own situation. So. Um, we have been exercising this framework with different tools. And the, but the most important thing is that we adapt the 10 principles to the Indonesian Government Performance Index. Because government at, at any level in any department, they should make reports. Um, and we uh, find out what the reports contain. So uh, we say to them, we can make your report look good if you support us in this and that. Because we know what the key performance indexes are. And if they want to perform better, so they better work together with us in, uh, in uh, materializing these 10 principles. So we also help the government uh, by uh, translating these, in, uh, these uh, 10 principles uh, to a Creative City Index dashboard. Uh, that has become a tool uh, for them to make decisions and so on. Uh, this dashboard is not fully running yet because it's still in the uh, in the beta form because it needs substantial data from different departments also at the national level. But at the local level, we can already exercise this and we have produced uh, for West Java uh, two years in a row and we have a third one coming out uh, for the West Java indexing. There is, there is actually to tell that uh, our creativity is there, but then what aspect do I need to work together with other cities are? So we know our, uh, we know our uh, what point we are good at, at what point we still need to um, collaborate with the rest. So we've been exercising with this by also disseminating, uh, publishing, and uh, contributing to also another uh, global uh, events, uh, especially lately Indonesia is, uh, the president, holds the presidency of G20. So we've been involved in G20 uh, since 2020. Uh, what we, because we believe that creative economy is important for the future, for the, uh, especially for the Global South development, then we try to really put the economy, uh, creative economy keyword at least at the highest level of the communique of the G20, or also of the engagement groups. So we were involved in, at the 2020, uh, 2021, and then this year uh, at Urban 20 and also Think Tank 20, and also uh, a lot of uh, uh, publication that is produced by this international forum. And with that, I end my presentation by uh, the World Conference on Creative Economy that just happened uh, last month. Uh, it has points uh, actually to lead uh, wherever you're from, you must have your own priorities and you must have all your own nomenclature for governments and so on. And, and this quadrant could help you choose which one to go on first. Uh, 
with, within your respective places. So, of course, there are new, uh, there's, uh, there are concerns of IP uh, and the rights of the creatives about uh, global revival because we're not done yet uh, with the pandemic and the future of creative economy, inclusivity, and the SDGs. So, thank you, John. Thank you. Well, thank you, all the speakers. So, uh, let's have some questions. If we have some questions, can we get the questions up? Oh, okay. Well, it's a good one to start with. Laura, how okay. can we encourage we the do? private sector to impact investment in the creative industries? What's the right starting point? And I'd like the rest of you to come in on that, but Laura, why don't we start with you? So the approach that we've been taking in the United States, I would say, is twofold. One, uh, understand what proper investment looks like. Encourage people who have track records, professional experience in investing to come with you in this journey to advance impact investing in the creative economy. If you begin ex by expecting people will give up the investment considerations because they will be so strongly compelled by the social and environmental considerations, um, I think you will not have success. I think you need to have uh, an investment context, background, and expertise to be able to make a persuasive case for the creative economy in the impact investing conversation. So my own background, I worked on Wall Street for six years. I managed two $3 billion endowments for two philanthropic organizations. Uh, I worked at McKinsey and Company with a focus on impact investing. So I brought a certain uh, ex level of professional investment experience to the conversation. But I also, prior to launching this NGO, Upstart Collab, was the senior deputy chairman for the Federal Arts Agency in the United States. So I was able to bring the two sides together. So I think having legitimate, professional, top-notch financial acumen is crucial. I think the second thing, and this is what I tried to describe in my um, review of the, the type of impact that we talk about at Upstart. We meet impact investors where they are on the impact concepts that they've already decided matter to them. We use the types of measures and metrics that impact investors already use, and we talk about creative activity in the context of business and enterprise. We didn't come in with a completely new array of measures and metrics that were focused on aesthetics and beauty and deliciousness and wonderment and all these great words we love to t use to describe what is special about creativity and culture. We all know that creativity and culture is unique. It's not the same as science and medicine and business. It's, there's something special about it. But to find the common ground with impact investors, we believed it was very important and we've seen success in demonstrating how they can achieve not only their financial goals, but also their very specific impact goals and metrics successfully achieve those goals in the creative industries. So we've met them where they are, both in terms of their investment expectations and the way they're thinking about the impact they're trying to achieve. Thank you. Hey, look, we're running late, so we're gonna be crisp in going through the questions and the answers, but Laura, can I just ask you this question here? Sure. How can we increase impact investment in Turkey? Now, I know you've, in, in the, are there some particular issues in the Turkish context that you think, with your experience, need to be borne in mind? So I would just encourage the creative industry leaders in Turkey to engage with the, those folks leading the growing impact investing conversation here. Uh, there seem to be two NGOs that are working in this way, some domestically and some with ties to some global bodies like the Global Steering Group for Impact Investing. Engage them, bring a dialogue, demonstrate the role that the creative industries are playing in the, um, the economic planning for the country already and the importance that the creative industries have been demonstrated to play in other countries like the example we just heard about from Indonesia and do some of the heavy lifting for them so that they can uh, see you as allies as they're trying to grow impact investing as a new movement here. Thank you. And there's a question here about cultural impact not just in the, context, in the context of investment, but culture, how do we assess cultural impact? I mean, I would say that 
in fact, in thinking about most of the policies that we're all talking about, all these different forms of impact, social, cultural, environmental, and economic, are integrated. And that's one of the complexities of the issue. But I'd like to ask any member of the panel who'd like to respond first, what do you think about how we, how we assess the integration of these different kinds of impact in thinking about growing the creative economy? Tita, you've done some thinking about this, and then I want to come to Edna and, and Marcel. Uh, well, if we talk about the structure level of the government, our nomenclature uh, separate culture and creative economy, which is sad, because then culture is under the Ministry of uh, Education and Culture, creative economy the Ministry of Tourism and Creative Economy, um, because we have different law for that set of laws. So they have their own indexes, if they're counting culture, like how many uh, music player you have, dancers, uh, uh, workers for crafts, and so on. While in creative economy, we're counting the values of the, the increase of the value of the culture they produce, and if they're within the creative economy uh, ecosystem as they are monetizing them, and so on. So in a way, it's different, but yeah, we, con we include that in our index uh, with the value at, at the uh, bottom of the thinking. Thank you. Edna. Well, I would like to add that we see the creative economy as a kind of development strategy. So it's not uh, because when you talk about creative economy, we are talk about job creation, we are talk about export earnings, we are talk about uh, social inclusion, we are addressing a number of uh, social issues, and now we are looking a lot of sustainability issues also. So I see the creative economy as this interplay in which you have economics, technology, culture. And for that reason, I could see even uh, reacting to, to the other question, how you bring together uh, the state, private sector. I see the role of government as a facilitator in this process. And nowadays, we can have, uh, so what we need is some kind of institutional arrangement. I think this is very useful. Why? Because when you talk about creative economy, we are not only thinking in terms of a cultural policy. Cultural policy is quite different from policy for creative economy. Because cultural policy is one element of the creative economy. So, and that is why you can see the complexity, because you have to uh, try to achieve what we call interministerial decisions, a kind of a concerted approach in which it will influence what uh, Rora has mentioned, uh, the small and medium enterprises. So if the government are looking to the impact of young people that are unemployed, but on the other hand, they are very attracted by the creative sector. So we are looking to the creative sector from the economic perspective, from the enterprise perspective, from the micro perspective. But we also had the impact in job creation, in the exports, how we measure. It's quite complex measure the creative economy because you there is not a real consensus on the definitions, on the classification, and in my view, this is not important because what is important is to adapt, to have the shared vision and adapt to the local reality. What are the local reality? What applies to the US is not what applies for Brazil or for Turkey because our realities are different. So I think it's up to governments to really build those policies, trying to have this concerted approach in which you will involve Minister of Education, of the Culture, of Technology. You need, for instance, nowadays, if you don't have a, a digital infrastructure, how can you see a creativity flourish? Because you need uh, a high-speed internet to be creative, yeah? So it's very important to, to, to really try to bring together a kind of institutional arrangement, can be an interministerial task force, and also 
I see the creative economy, uh, it's quite important because it really brings a kind of participatory approach. So it's not something that should be imposed top down or bottom up, but it's something that will meet in the middle. And I think that is why important. You have to be open to have a dialogue with the sector involving private sector, involving academia, involving the, in particular the creative professionals, the artists, and also having government as a facilitator to facilitate these dialogues and to shape the policies that are needed to support the sector. Thank you. Marcel, do you want to add to that? Yes. I, in my perspective, I think that the impact, impact can be can be achieved under several conditions. Yeah? It, is, uh, it doesn't come from, from, from sky or from free. And one of these conditions of, is the common understanding of the problem solving. And I think that we need to combine the creative way how to solve the problems and the way how to really solve yeah, step by step. Um, for example, uh, impact is important for investors in terms of uh, impact investment, but also for researchers in research projects. Impact oriented should be also policy makers. And um, what's the crucial thing is to be able to, to, to create a common understanding how to solve the problems there. I think uh, we've all uh, heard this morning the use of the phrase intersecting used a lot. And I think one of the issues around the creative economy is that it is about intersection. And the one thing that comes clear from all the work that we do, and I'm sure many of you will have the same experience, one thing that came across to us in drawing up our 11-point agenda is the structures of government, the structures of policy are suited for a 20th century economy. They don't think about how we integrate culture, society, ec economy and environment in a way that we need to in the 21st century. But look, I'm going to be very unpopular and draw this session to a close because, it, Edna, you referred to definitions of the creative economy. Food is often described as one of the things that ought to be considered a part of the creative economy, and I think we should address the question of food. But before we do that, uh, I'm going to ask Elif just to wrap up the session uh, and thank all our panelists. Elif. Thank you, John, and all of our speakers here today for keeping the time, which is uh, our utmost concern, I guess, at the moment. And of course, we're all hungry. Why not? We're going to go to lunch very soon. I guess a lot of what has been said weaves into one another very um, seamlessly here. I, well, impact was the buzzword, of course, of this session. And how to measure it, how to define it, of course, that needs uh, a lot more time and I guess more um, uh, context to unpack. However, Marcel, the point you made about impact-oriented research and innovation, how it can solve many of today's uh, societal problems was, I guess, the key message of uh, your presentation. The, the problems, of course, Edna, uh, you know, gave us a sense about, you know, how deep of a transformation our societies are going through right now and um, how the biggest challenge uh, for governments is to resume growth. Uh, this, these points really stuck with me because um, obviously the creative economy cannot, just like Edna you said, cannot be seen in isolation and it's really, of course, it's part of a, a global context, it's, it's part of a more um, wider context I guess so um, in terms of that I guess your point about soft power and how it, it contributes to the image of a, of a country was really um, welcomed by me I really um, as a journalist here of course I, I find that very um, uh, I, well, eye-opening in a way and Laura obviously uh, the points you made about the social impacts um, the creative industries can deliver and the, you know, the list, I mean, the bullet points that you gave, of course, are very, one thing that um, comes clear of that is uh, the social impact that can be achieved uh, by um, investing in creative industries 
is key, important, it's very important and it needs to be stressed once again. And thanks so much for doing that. Again, as I said, all of them really uh, weaved in very nicely in my eyes. I do need to, of course, the, the need for action at local, national and international uh, level and, you know, how to get all of, three, all of these three levels in some kind of a harmony is, of course, uh, not to be missed as well. I'm not going to take more of your time, just like John announced uh, you know, a few minutes earlier. We're getting hungry. Time to refill our energy stores. Lunch will be provided at the Maidan foyer area. You can reach the location by taking the stairs and lifts at the back of the room. And then I will see you down there at the lunch. There will be a very nice musical performance. Thanks so much for attending this session. Thank you.